the Arctic Ocean, five and a half million square miles of sea and ice. One of the most dangerous places on Earth. But every year, an extraordinary team of skydivers carve out an airport just 20 miles from the North Pole. Beside it, an oasis springs up in this frozen desert, Ice Camp Barnea. Five-star Arctic hotel. <laughs> the camp is a magnet for people with big dreams. I've just been dipping my boot in the end of the runway. <laughs> <laughs> Marathon runners. It's so tired, you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are. You want to die. Champagne tourists. It's a long drive contest, apparently. And international scientists. Yeah, sort of like a God made you a laboratory right out in the perfect spot. Amateur adventurers go in search of the ultimate experience. It's just like walking into a different world that you never would have dreamed or prepared for. We could be going to absolute carnage. <laughs> They have just three weeks to pursue their Arctic dreams before Barnea melts into the sea. <laughs> this is one season at the world's most extreme outpost. Yeah. Welcome to the Arctic Ocean! It's early April, and 20 miles from the North Pole, the heated tents of Ice Camp Barnea are full to bursting. An ice runway, little more than a metre thick, brings a steady flow of visitors from the mainland. Uh, how far from North Pole? The man in charge is Misha Malakov, a polar veteran. His expeditions in the Arctic earned him the title Hero of the Russian Federation. Yeah, I like Arctic just because it's always changing. All the time says to you, be careful. You should work uh, hard, then you will be safe. But at the same time, it creates such great feeling. You are a man, you are alive, and uh, it keeps your body alive all the time. One of the highlights of the season is the North Pole Marathon. The coldest race on Earth is the brainchild of 46-year-old Richard Donovan, an extreme runner from Galway in Ireland. God, this place is lovely, you know, and, and it's perfect for a running race. It almost feels a little bit like home to me now, it being the 10th year coming up here. Richard entered the record books as the first person to complete marathons at both the North and South Poles. It actually came about when I ran the South Pole Marathon myself in 2002 and it seemed obvious to me that I had to go to the North Pole and run one up there. And I did and then I realised I should turn this into a race and that other people might like it as well. Although there's no shortage of space in the Arctic, the athletes have to stick close to camp. There's a real danger of death if cracks suddenly open in the ice. Richard must choose the race route with caution. And I think I'm going to target a 4.2 kilometer loop today. And they will have to do that 10 times. One of the other issues, of course, is there's the remote possibility of a polar bear. And that's another reason not to head off into the distance for too long. The course will soon be ready, but the runners are a long way from the start line. 600 miles south of Barneo is the Norwegian island of Spitsbergen. Its largest town, Longyearbyen, serves as a staging post to Barneo and the ice. Marathon runners from around the world have flown here for the big event. Becky Newman from London is getting in some last minute training. Today at the North Pole, it's only minus 25. It's actually ideal running temperatures. But looking at the temperature change over the last week, it was minus 43 days ago. 
You know, we're going to a crazy place. Running on ice is a new experience for Becky. It's so hard. I mean, I've just run a mile, if that, and I'm completely shattered. This is like nothing else. I, I really hope I can do it. I just so hope I can do it. I'm absolutely bricking it now. Single mum Becky runs a pub back home. The challenge ahead holds a special significance. I'm trying to raise £10,000 for a local charity called Headway because back in 2005 my sister died of a brain hemorrhage and it was very sudden. She was only 43 years old. So I can think of no greater or better motivation than doing the North Pole Marathon. The Arctic offers many challenges. Some are physical, others mental. Mark Wood, a full-time explorer from Coventry, is attempting to travel to the pole alone. I quite enjoy guiding teams, but it is quite nice being responsible for yourself. And sometimes it's good to, to, to see who you, who you are, really. You, know, not, you don't get many chances in life to, to find out who you are, really. Rather than sleep in a hotel, Mark pitches his tent away from the crowds on the edge of town. Just a few weeks ago, he was standing at the other end of the planet. And it was the unknown. When I arrived in Antarctica, I was really scared. I didn't know what was going to happen, whether I could cope. You know, it, it's freezing cold, you know, all the usual suspects are there. The, the, the ice, the snow, the cold, the loneliness. And it's how you make the best of that is what I enjoy. And I, I spent 50, 50 days in here. <laughs> Mark settles in for the night. Tomorrow, he'll head to Barneo to face the Arctic wilderness. Barneo's first flight of the day touches down safely. On board are a group of athletes come to test themselves in the coldest race on Earth, the North Pole Marathon. Amazing. Just, I can't believe I'm here. I'm just trying to take it all in. The race attracts an international crowd, each paying £10,000 to challenge themselves in the sub-zero temperatures. And to run a marathon on the top of the world? How amazing is that? Rhoda is an ER doctor from New Orleans. She's aiming to become the first African-American woman to complete a marathon at both poles. I'm so excited about it, you know? This, this is a childhood dream of mine to come to the North Pole. Charity manager Demelza has been training at home in Australia. Running in, in the heat, in my singlet and shorts, and my massive big woolen socks for months, and now suddenly, and being ridiculously hot and sweaty, and now I'm not hot and sweaty at all. <laughs> I love it though, I love pushing myself, I love trying new things, but this is extreme, huh? Oh, oh look at that husky! After a two hour flight from the mainland, the athletes are in need of a quick comfort break. You for the loo at the North Pole! <laughs> Brilliant! But Becky is in for a nasty surprise. She has a choice between two portable loos, an ice urinal or an oil drum chamber pot. Oh, come on, it's pretty stinking. I thought, I thought it was stinking the North Pole for some reason. Think of Glastonbury on day three. You get in the North Pole toilet, OK? And it's cold. I, I took a glove off and held on to the, the lock. I locked it with, and, and I just stuck to the lock. Springtime at the pole means 24 hours of daylight. The sun never rises or sets, moving in a straight line across the horizon each day. It's 10 p.m., but there's no time for the runners to acclimatize. The race is about to start. Marathon organizer Richard wants to take advantage of the good weather. I guess it's strange thinking I'm not going to sleep, but I think the adrenaline's going. So, yeah, I think I just want to go for it. Then I think everybody has all this nervous energy and we want to get it out. Everybody's ready to rock and roll here. Okay, we go back to the line. 
behind the line there, please. 41 competitors from 18 countries line up for the most extreme race on Earth. Good luck, team. Good luck, Tim. Hey, good luck. Okay. okay, is everybody ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay, three, two, one, go. <laughs> the athletes now face 26 miles of ice and snow in bone chilling temperatures of 21 degrees below zero. Marathon underway, Barneo's airport welcomes yet more adventurers. Solo explorer Mark, attempting back-to-back -back treks to both poles, is in his element. Beautiful, a frozen moon. <laughs> and I'm smiling, this is the first time I've smiled in about 10 days. I'm just like, woohoo! Oh man! Plan is to uh, get some coordinates, uh, get the fuel and then uh, find a time when I can start the expedition and head off. But Mark is about to find out this is Misha's kingdom. He'll have to convince the boss of Barneo he's up to the task ahead. You know, I, uh, my, my, my journey is solo and, uh, and that's what I'm going to take it as. Um, and I will find, you know, when, when things come up, I'll deal with it. I need to, if I need to call you guys in, I'll call you guys in. There's never been a death at Barneo. Misha is determined that record will stay intact. He's turned around and said, you know, join this for the team. And I'm like, <laughs> no, this is solo. So he's trying to tell me to join another team. And I'm like, no, it's my life at the end of the day. Eh? So. Misha knows just how dangerous this place can be. The camp is built on sheets of drifting sea ice. The environment can change in an instant. Two years ago, this happened. It was like Venice here. Really, I'm not kidding. The runway was uh, cracks along the runway and it cracks all around the camp, so different uh, tents were drifting away in different pieces of ice, and the big tent, one of mess room, the water was just straight under the door. One guy's opening the door, water blows in the door. The Arctic Ocean is two and a half miles deep here. Cracks are caused by wind and sea currents, which push and pull the ice. We are all uh, superstitious here. So the Russian polar guys are thinking, if you need to keep your piece of ice solid, don't shave your beard. That's why I'm not shaving my beard for months. Finally, Mark is given the all clear to start his solo trek to the pole. He'll be doing what's known as the last degree. A 70 mile journey from 89 to 90 degrees north. Once the helicopter has dropped him on the ice, Mark's only link to the outside world will be a satellite phone. He'll be completely alone with nothing but 500 miles of ice in every direction. He's rigged his kit with cameras to record his journey. And the helicopter disappeared and went away. And bang, I'm alone. And it doesn't matter how long or short the journey is. It's that experience of being alone. You know, it's you against the environment at that point. The Arctic is so cold because up to 90% of the sun's rays are reflected back by the ice. But on the marathon course, the freezing temperatures aren't slowing down British pub owner Becky. It's wonderful. It's so lovely. 
lovely. It's flipping hard though. The first part of the course is okay. When you get to this bit, it's really soft, it's really deep. So you've got 50% to rest your legs a bit, 50% to kill yourself. American Dr. Rhoda is falling behind. Well, I'm keep moving. I walk a little bit, I run a little bit, but just keep moving. I'll keep plugging away until I finish. The polar weather is unforgiving. It's now minus 25 degrees centigrade, so cold that unprotected skin can be damaged in a matter of minutes. Race organizer Richard is on the lookout for signs of frostbite and hypothermia. As they become fatigued, there's more of a chance of something happening to them. And you often see white patches on the face, which can be frost damage. And you take those guys aside, you deal with it just by putting skin on skin. And that's the only way to heat it up. Can we use uh, ointment for you? Fortunately, the runners are in safe hands. Misha, the boss of Barneo, is not only a celebrated Arctic explorer, but also a qualified surgeon. No pain, no gain. <laughs> <laughs> Barneo is not just for thrill seekers, it's also a unique research base. The morning flight sees the return of some old friends, world leading experts in polar science. Today we received our incredible Antonov 74 plane in really good weather, and the plane brought the American scientists. Every year they bring in lots of heavy equipment and they will study here. We see each other every year, <laughs> so it's a lot of fun to rendezvous with your old friends again. Chief scientist Jamie Morrison leads a group of 15 US researchers and engineers. They've been coming to Barneo for the last 10 years. Sort of like a God made you a laboratory right out in the perfect spot. The team are here to conduct experiments to see if the polar ice cap is shrinking. Some scientists believe that a reduction of Arctic ice could cause massive climate change. We know that the region's changing and so we want to connect the dots between chemistry and snow and sea ice. We want to understand that field so that we can determine how things will change in the future. The scientists have come armed with some heavy-duty instruments to gather their data. This is a buoy that will be measuring a lot of atmospheric chemistry. The team will bury a total of 18 devices in the ice sheet, which floats on top of the ocean. These buoys are part of a, a bigger network. We're trying to gain a foothold in, in making measurements across the broad Arctic. <laughs> Alone and heading to the North Pole, Mark is making his own discoveries. This frozen sea can be perilous. Without warning, the ice sheets separate, creating temporary areas of open water known as leads. So standing in this, uh, this hard open lead here, it's quite hard here and then you can see it gets softer and softer and then there's, there's actually water down there. If Mark should fall through the ice, he has no one to drag him to safety. <laughs> Antarctica is very flat and open and kind of boring in a way. This place is very different. It's, it's, a, it's a fair ground. It's incredible. At night you can hear the scenery being changed. You can hear the ice cracking and breaking, the, the ocean moving below you and forming these ridges that you see the next day. Beautiful, sculptured, pure blocks of ice. And some of them are the size of cars. 
but Mark's perfect solitude is about to be shattered. The North Pole Marathon runners have been out in the punishing sub-zero conditions for more than four hours. Single mum Becky still has three laps of the two and a half mile circuit to go. I'm just doing the final push. I am knackered. It's so hard. It's tradition for one Barneo team member to enter the race. Defending the camp's honour this year is Yuri. Decided to uh, run just uh, last minute. Uh, like big boxer, so, uh, like very brave guy. Like Mike Tyson, skydiver. <laughs> All the runners will make regular stops in the heated food tent. Oh, good tea, thank you. The brakes are essential to survive the punishing conditions. I've worked out in the Sahara Desert and various other places, but I don't think that anyone actually beats the North Pole just for the savagery and the, the whiteness of the environment. Charity manager Demelza is running with her long-term boyfriend, James. My body's beginning to go, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Because not very many people can. And I'm going to. And it's beautiful. It's the most incredible experience. The sound on the ice as you're running. The midnight sun coming through the clouds, the way that the sun hits the ice particles in the air as you're running along, it's, it's unbelievable. We always train together, we always run together. Shared experience just makes it all that more special. Scottish doctor Andrew Murray has kept an incredible pace. He comes home first in a time of four hours and 17 minutes. But it's taken its toll. It doesn't get much more surreal than finishing a race at 2.30 in the morning at the North Pole. It's some feeling just actually finishing the thing. And uh, it'll be really nice just to get the chance to cheer everyone else in. Come on, Becky! One more to go, Rebecca! The home team are looking for a big finish. Yuri isn't going to disappoint them. Our skydiver, Dr. Black, is going to finish the race. Yuri is one of the skydivers who built the runway. Clearly, he's not afraid of the cold. It is my first marathon. Australian Demelza takes the crown as the fastest woman with a time of six hours and six minutes. Oh my God. And boyfriend James has an unexpected prize for him. Oh, I'm oh. me? Look, I'm wearing everything. Can you marry me? Yes, would be good. Oh my god! Are you ever losing She did say yes. Yay! <laughs> he nailed it, he nailed it. <laughs> Running around and seeing Demelza and watching her work, I was so proud of her. I thought, you know, I've, got, I've really got to put the icing on the cake here and um, absolutely the right moment, so. I honestly, I, I had no idea. I thought you never wanted Thanks, to get guys. married. Thank you. I can't believe it. <laughs> A few minutes later, an exhausted Becky collapses over the line. Oh, my gosh. Becky? Yeah, hi, hi. Second, lady, second home. lady home. Did I get second? second again. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Here's Judy behind you. Come on, Judy! <laughs> one by one, the shattered runners struggle to the finish line. 
some with more style than others. Well done, Jay. Wow, that is easily the toughest marathon in the world. It's been an experience they will never forget. That last two laps weren't good, though, because it's, you're so tired, you don't know where you are, you don't know who you are, you don't know, you want to die. What time is it? Half four in the morning. <laughs> there are no injuries and no serious frostbites. Very well uh, prepared people, very good. But Dr. Roder is still out on the course. Oh, I feel like I can keep going indefinitely. I got my little, shuffle, my little shuffle going on, and I'm gonna shuffle right to the finish line. It's more than seven hours into the marathon, and Rhoda still has another 10 miles to go. The sun never sets on Barnell. The runway works day and night. A new flight has brought in more scientists. And we are uh, a French uh, polar scientist expedition, and we are two guys, and we will spend uh, three weeks on the sea ice. We try to better understand this place, this crazy place. Parisians Julien and Alan are here to collect plankton, which is thought to behave differently in the Arctic. But they're worried that pollution from the ice camp will affect their samples. The plan is now uh, just to live east from here, so to be outside of the main pollution of Barneo, or from the camp, from the generator, from the helicopter. So just to stay in a polluted area, it's no point to come here, so that's why we need to leave. But their plans are about to hit a snag. They can't do their study in Barneo, but they can't leave unless camp boss Misha says so. Uh, you don't have big experience to travel uh, on drifting ice of Arctic Ocean. Am I right? We have done a bit of it. We have done a bit of it. Where at? The east coast of Greenland. Yeah, Greenland, exactly. it is not yeah. Arctic Ocean. No. And you should not cross any open water, my point of view. Alan, do you understand what I mean? Yeah. It means uh, uh, chances that uh, uh, this ice will be broken and you can be lost. Not so much. Uh, yeah. No, definitely. Still concerned by their lack of polar experience, Misha insists on checking their kit. Most important is your, uh, your uh, brain. If you have even very good equipment, but uh, uh, your brain not ready for it, it's useless. Uh, everything is useless. Finally, Misha agrees to allow the French team onto the ice. But there's a condition. They must stay close to the camp so he can keep an eye on them. Arctic Ocean is basically a flat area. You need to ski as straight as possible. Too many pressure ridges and obstacles. You can see a trail from the skiers and you cannot say, is it experienced person or not experienced person? Usually experienced person goes straight, 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 even through pressure ridges. All the runners in the North Pole Marathon have finished, apart from one. Rhoda from New Orleans has been out on the ice for over 11 hours, and she's starting to get confused. OK, where's the flag? I just wanted to make sure I was on this right path, because after you do 10 of these, things get kind of fuzzy, you know? This is my last lap. Her perseverance has won her an admirer. Barneo's doctor, Stanislav. She's useful. After 11 hours and 52 minutes, Rhoda makes it to the finish. I can't tell you how happy I am right now. No matter how hard it is, I stick with it. And whatever I start, I finish. No matter what. We've got a special present from Barneo team. 
That one oh. for very brave girl. Yeah, okay. yeah, for finish. All right, thank yes, you. Yes, very well. <laughs> thank very you. Well. <sighs> Mark Wood is alone in the midst of five and a half million square miles of ice. At the end of his first day, he's 11 miles closer to the North Pole. And now I've pitched my tent out in the open, but it's nice being back out again. Uh, the area is beautiful. Take a look around there. But the weird thing about it being here is the noise. You know, you get silence all the way through the day, and then you hear a crack or a boom or something like that, and it's just the, the, the sea moving underneath the ice. And it's quite scary, really. Mark will consume up to 8,000 calories a day during his trip. All of his hot food is prepared by melting snow over a small stove. So. Let me just show you this. This is my pudding. And basically, it's apple and custard, porridge and raisins. You can even taste the meal from last night in it, which was like a meaty stew. So you got that added, added extra custard and for sort the of meat effect. It's good. In Barneo, thoughts also turn to food, though in slightly larger quantity. The 48 staff are winding down for the day, but the marathon runners are keen to enjoy the spoils of the race. Tonics with Arctic ice. Yeah, we're having a great time. This is the place to be on the North Pole right now. <laughs> I love measuring around the world where I've been drunk and seen great places, but this has got to be one of the better ones so far. <laughs> Cheers, my dear. Cheers. Well done. <laughs> dear Jim, it's been my dream to do the North Pole Marathon. <laughs> <laughs> for some time now. It's wondering. Oh, 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 oh. oh well, Rebecca Newman, I reckon we could fix it for you to go to the North Pole and do the marathon. Oh, oh, oh. She doesn't actually need to drink anything. <laughs> but when you add alcohol, it's just, it's quite scary. <laughs> The camp of French science team Alan and Julien is as far from Barneo as Misha will allow. They're here to collect plankton samples. To reach these microscopic beasts, they must cut a hole in the ice. But it refreezes after just a few hours. The sea ice becomes like this in uh, even less than 12 hours, actually. That's why we cut it twice a day. We can see directly the life under the sea ice because we, we can't imagine that uh, some uh, things can live in this place because it's a very hard place. When you wake up every morning, you are in a warm uh, sleeping bag. In the tent, the temperature is uh, minus 20. It's really not a comfortable place. Even though they're just a few miles from Barneo, they must still take precautions. So this is our bedroom, our tent. So we protect it against polar bear with uh, this trip wire. It will uh, hit this uh, wire. And then the trigger here will go out and uh, this flare will uh, go up and explode. So maybe it will afraid the polar bear. But, uh, otherwise at least it will wake up us and uh, we'll be aware that there is a polar bear around. So. This place is one of the most dangerous places in the world. Everything can happen. Polar bears, uh, the sea ice can be broken. You can die very fast. <laughs> 
Two days later, the weather has changed dramatically. Areas of open water in the ice create fog. Even the rescue choppers are grounded, leaving anyone out on the ice completely cut off. Solo explorer Mark is still over 30 miles from the pole, in an environment that grows more hostile by the minute. This is tough work, man. This is tough work. Very slow progress. At Ice Camp Barneo, the American scientists are ready to deploy their giant buoy. The probe will take vital ice and atmospheric measurements. It weighs the best part of a ton, so the team will need the help of the Russians. Next step uh, will be the helicopter picking this buoy up and, uh, and basically inserting it in that hole. The camp is running flat out and the helicopters are in big demand. To make sure his team gets one, Andy resorts to a little light-hearted bribery. The management came in our tent the other day and needed something, but it was a can of nuts on the... And he just, before he said anything, helped himself. So I said, OK, you took your nuts, now we want something in return. And after that, the nuts have become a joke, you know, so... Having discovered the real currency of Barneo, Andy heads off to see operations director Misha. Oh, just a moment, uh, your weather, uh, ah, I see. And this is not a gift, it's a bribe. Not for camera! <laughs> Bad man! Listen, I am not accepted that for camera, I am not accepting it. No, because it's a bribe. It's a gift, it's a gift now. As gift, thank you very much. <laughs> but sorry, I, I need to answer to another. Absolutely. Once you get far enough north, uh, you help each other. Money doesn't mean anything. You need to help each other out. And that, that's the beauty of the Arctic, I think. With access to the helicopter sorted, the boy is ferried to the deployment site. The helicopter crew, normally based in Siberia, must now show their unique skills. Да, конечно, поэтому сюда и попадают те, кто имел опыт в таких условиях. У нас тут три инструктора из наших четырех летчиков. The pilot can't see beneath them. He must hold the helicopter perfectly steady. The buoy, which costs a hundred thousand pounds, must be placed into a hole just 50 centimeters wide. They've done it. With the boy in place, the team can celebrate. That's pretty good flying. That was a nice job they did. This is going to end up in the North Atlantic. It takes about a year to get from here down to the entrance to the Greenland Sea and open water. As the ice sheet drifts on the ocean, the boy will drift with it. Scientists worldwide will study the data it beams back to better understand the ice cap and its effect on the Earth's climate. Over at the skydiver's tent, the marathon runners are discovering the polar cure for a hangover. Oh my gosh, look at them all. That is bloody freezing. The icicles on my nipples. It's not my nipples, I'm worried. Where I'm from, they say those men have balls. Oh my God, she's very brave. 
I would never do it. <laughs> it's just numb. My body is completely numb. I don't think I'll be doing it again. <laughs> Away from camp, Mark has been battling the ice alone for six days. This is one situation I didn't really want to get into. <laughs> I just got to get it out, haven't I? It's it's strange to believe that uh, you know just a, a few a few weeks ago I was standing at the geographic South Pole, um, and now I'm heading to the North Pole itself. This is awesome. I'm going to arrive at the North Pole, the top of the world, solo, completely isolated, and, and this is how I want it to be. As Mark finally reaches the pole, his week of solitude is shattered. <laughs> I work at the North Pole, man. I don't know what's going on there. I'll go and have a look, but you'd think you'd be alone, eh? <laughs> oh, well. Mark will have to share the pole with a wedding party. But there's a silver lining to this unwelcome intrusion. The groom, Borga Ausland, is one of Norway's most highly celebrated explorers and a hero to Mark. Incredible, I feel like I'm dreaming. That's amazing. <laughs> He's the man. He's the man, you know. That orgasm at the end. It's emotional. <laughs> this is... You were invited, you just came in. Oh yeah, I'm sorry I'm late. I should have dressed better as well. I should have worn a tie in that. <laughs> At Barneo, there's one last treat in store for the marathon runners. Really, really exciting. We've only got about 10 or 15 minutes to go, and now we're on a helicopter heading to the North Pole. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> the 30-minute chopper ride over the perilous ice is an easy way to reach the pole. But safety is still an issue. I like the chopper ride a lot. It's my favourite part of the trip, I have to say. And when everybody gets here, you know, you've kind of uh, delivered what you're supposed to do. And uh, as you can see, everybody's delighted. I'm about to jump one, two, three. It's beautiful. Yeah, it is amazing. I feel like David Attenborough should appear any minute now, talking to me about ice flows. It's very beautiful. No trip to the pole would be complete without the traditional jog around the world. Some kind of pilgrim ceremony going on now. It's like we're going around a maypole. When you can see uh, happy uh, faces of people, you are getting uh, happy also. It's so actually a good job to uh, uh, make people happy, just to give them something very emotional and very good memory. Here, here. A team of huskies race to the top of the world. <laughs> A 17-year-old schoolboy juggles adventure and revision. I actually have my first day level three days after my flight back to London. And tension flares for Barneo's boss. You are happy I don't arrive tomorrow. Why? I didn't want to say something there. 